Welcome to this webinar um, on spaces and scales in, in sorry in spaces and scales in global security. Thanks so much for for joining us. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Annette Edler. I'm the director of the Global Security Program at Pembroke College and faculty member at the Blavatnik School of Government, where I also lead the Minerva Global Security Program. First of all, I'd like to thank the DT Institute, which provides generous support for the series. I'd also like to say a particular thanks to the Blavatnik School of Government, um, our excellent host here and Pembroke College, and also my team, especially Frederick Florence, who helped us bring everyone together. Now, this is the third webinar in our new webinar series on global security. Um, we had first a very exciting opening round table on thinking about global security with Deborah Avon, Pino Bilgin, Adam Roberts, and Amitav Acharya. We then had a second session on epistemologies and methodologies with Professor Neil Johnson, Dr. Inara Hamati Ataya, and Professor Veronica Subiyaga. And we still have one more session before the spring break next week. After that, we'll reconvene for another four sessions in Trinity term, so at the end of April. In each of these sessions, um, our goal is to bring together academics with policymakers or practitioners or those who work across both um, spheres um, to make sure that our intellectual engagement helps tackle real-world um, security challenges. Now, the purpose of the webinar series is to explore, therefore, the meaning and practice of global security as part also of our research here at, um, at Oxford. <clears throat> now, um, I would like to just kind of remind us of the findings um, that we had last uh, week when we talked about the epistemologies and methodologies. So there we had some key takeaway um, uh, points, which included, first of all, that research needs to be embedded in a long-term timeframe so that we can understand also long-term security trends. Secondly, another key takeaway point was that research is not just about collecting and analyzing data, but also um, uh, about representing that data and analysis in a way that makes it understandable across different disciplines. And that we basically as researchers also need to constantly think about whether there are certain biases in the way we collect the data, in the way that we interpret the data, and of course, also what the underlying assumptions here are. And then thirdly, um, we, we thought about how that really then links to um, uh, representing an objective reality or to what extent we can even talk about something like that when it comes to security. Now, these points are crucial for how we study global security. And here in our program, we study that particularly by looking at three interlinked um, dimensions. First of all, the political dimension, by which I mean global order and um, geostrategic power. Um, then secondly, the economic dimension, that is the network of transnational um, supply chains, how different types of supply chains are interconnected. And then thirdly, the, local dim the social dimension, which refers to local experiences of stability or, or instability. And of course, all these dimensions operate across different scales, across the local level, the national level, the transnational and the global level, and also both in physical and non-physical non space. And that's why we decided to include this webinar here, the theme of spaces and scales to really think through hard what we actually mean by that. How can we understand global? Does something like that exist? How does it operate across those different spaces and, and scales? But before we start, um, we would like to just quickly run a brief call that we've done um, in the past uh, webinars as well. So the audience member can see this here now. Um, so if you could just quickly um, click on that, we ask here, in your opinion, what do you think is the most important space in global security today? So we have here um, the different options, right? There's first of all, cyberspace as one option. Then we have outer space. We have the maritime space, the local contexts, international context, but then also the intersection of the above um, spaces. So let's see if we can get any responses from, from audience members. Um, and in the meantime, I will just move on and um, introduce our distinguished speakers while we wait for their results. So first of all, um, let me introduce you to um, one of our guests here, Professor Diane Davis. 
She is the um, Charles Steyer Norton Professor of Regional Planning and Urbanism at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. Um, before moving to the Graduate School of Design, um, she served as the head of the International Development Group in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT, where she also had a term as Associate Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning. Then secondly, um, I'd like to also just um, introduce my, my other distinguished panelist, Ranchana Kaur, who is partner at Dua Associates, a leading law firm in India. Now she specializes in the international law of outer space um, and among other areas, she advises on issues related um, to the participation of non-government entities in outer space activities and relating to commercial satellite services, including telecommunications and um, earth observation. And then last but not least, um, let me introduce my colleague, um, Professor Kieran Martin, who is a professor of practice in the management of public organizations here at the Blavatnik School of Government. And prior to joining the school, Kieran was the founding chief executive of the National Cybersecurity Center, which is part of the GCHQ. So welcome everyone. As you can see, we have brought together experts that come to the topic from very particular angles, right? Um, from the angle of territoriality, um, then cyberspace, of course, and also um, the outer space. So I can't see the result of the poll yet, um, but we might wanna go back to this at the end of the session. So let me just start with um, the questions right away. And ah, here we have the results, right? So it seems that half of the audience members actually think that we need to think about the intersection of the above spaces. Well, I'm very glad that we hear that, that we see that. Um, of course, cyberspace is also quite um, high up here. Outer space, marine, marine space, local context are not seen to be that relevant, the international context, but it seems there is quite a fair, yeah, um, equal distribution across different spaces and, and scales. So that's that's quite interesting. Now, Yaron, let's, let's start with you. Um, what would you say if you think about those intersections? Where, if at all, do these spaces intersect? And um, how are the spaces of global security evolving? Drawing perhaps particularly on your perspective on, on, on cyberspace. Um, thanks, Anetta. Thanks for having me. Huge set of questions. I'll try to be uh, brief but relevant. I'm pleased that somebody voted for cyberspace so that otherwise I wouldn't um, uh, <laughs> feel a little bad about intervening. I think um, there is a genuinely global uh, dimension to um, cyberspace in terms of uh, security and vulnerabilities. I suppose the most um, potent example of that was a couple of incidents in the middle of 2017 when uh, both of which were mistakes. Uh, one was um, uh, North Korea trying to steal some money from some uh, Asian banks unleashing a computer virus which went into 100 countries, including um, countries that might be more sympathetic to North Korea than others. So it wasn't just the classic Western targets, but Russia got badly hit, uh, the UK got badly hit, but China got hit um, uh, as well. And then six weeks later, uh, the Russians were having another go at the digital harassment of Ukraine. This is long before the full invasion, uh, of course. Um, but they got it wrong and released. They were attacking a Ukrainian tax software program that was used by Ukrainian businesses. It ended up going all over the world, um, putting Maersk, the shipping giant, out of action, but also just to show the genuinely global uh, connect, uh, connectivity aspect. Um, they halted production at a chocolate factory in uh, Tasmania, Australia, which I have to say was probably not the target of the operation in the first place. So there's a genuinely global aspect to sort of shared um, vulnerability. On the other hand, the phrase, um, one of the many phrases I ban when talking about cyberspace is the internet knows no borders. That's just nonsense. The internet knows plenty of borders. They're a bit more porous than they were, um, but you know, countries have, demonstrated um, that we were wrong 25 years ago to say that state control of the internet was impossible. You know, lots of countries, not just China, has shown you that you can apply state restrictions. You can't do it exclusively. So Russia's had a, a had a program to try to disconnect itself from the internet, have a complete standalone system. It doesn't quite work. Um, but on the other hand, you can, um, uh, you, you can do things at national uh, level. And the regional and local are really interesting. So um, we've gone from an era where essentially everything was built by the American private sector 
to a much more bipolar, you know, part US, part China led, and the rest of the world, um, particularly uh, India, um, other countries demanding more of a say in the way that tech uh, works over time. And I think that will only increase those tensions, those you know, becoming a sort of geopolitical uh, context. And the local does sometimes matter. And in the interest of time, I won't, I won't go on at any great length. But for example, there is a bit of land in sort of Moscow, St. Petersburg and surrounding areas, where has the, which has the largest concentration of cyber criminals in the world. And if you're in my field of cybersecurity and you look in, in, your, in the Western world as I am, and you look in the 2020s and the major cyber disruptions, very few of them have been the result of the horrible war, but quite a lot, whether in the US and you've had a pipeline outage, if you're in Ireland, you have the wholesale disruption of your healthcare system, in Sweden, where you've had food retail distribution problems and so forth. A lot of it is the fact that there is a concentration of activity um, for money uh, happening in that area. And for whatever reason, it's immune from the efforts or lack of them of law enforcement. So there's a specific, it's not to do with technology, it's the fact that there is this area of the world where a bunch of skilled people can operate freely outside the law and of course in the digital age you don't have to set foot in a country to to harm it so there is a complex uh, intersection and we are by no means in a borderless world yet even though we probably have a greater amount of pooled vulnerabilities as a result of the digital age than we had previously thank you so much kieran thanks you, you touched upon or you just ended with um, the fact or with, with the statement that we are not in a borderless world and um, that also some local sp um, spaces matter. Maybe Diane, could you uh, connect to that? Because I also know what we've talked a lot at Howard and elsewhere about the relevance of borders, right? In those spaces and how we can think about territoriality when it comes to security issues. What, what is your view on that? You're muted, sorry, could you just... Unmute yourself. Yes, right. early in the morning here. So <laughs> uh, th thanks, sorry, uh, thanks for inviting me. And I'm happy I'm going second here because you know, after your poll and I, if I had to take that poll, I would have said, yes, cyberspace is the most important thing because I think there's so much nefarious disruption that can happen and influence economies, people's daily lives in ways that we are like, uh, that could like, put everything at a standstill, which is bad for everybody. So, and so I'm so happy to hear, um, you know, that this is a kind of analysis. I, on the other hand, am, do work that's so grounded territorially. I'm not sure I can make the connections, <laughs> but I can answer the questions about um, that maybe a little bit more in the international context and thinking about the different scales uh, on the physical ground at which, um, we need to be paying more attention about kind of the expansion of, of security problems. So maybe later we'll talk about when that the hovering of cyber insecurity comes, you know, hits with like the everyday insecurity at, on the ground. That's kind of a serious problem. Um, so let me just quickly say that um, I work mostly I'm on the US, Mexico, Central America, Northern Latin America, up to Colombia border. And a very quick answer would be that I think that we've learned, and uh, Aneta, of course, is an expert on this, but we've learned to understand the networks, that there's insecurity at certain nodes in that large region that I've mentioned, and maybe they start, they're felt by people at certain nodes, but somehow or another, we're not looking at the relationship between the nodes of insecurity and the networks. Um, maybe there is a parallel in the cybersecurity, but like it, at what point, and the, the, the challenge for security analysts is where, obviously the answer is gonna be both places, but at what point do you try to address the network itself? And at what point do you try to address nodes in that network that might be central to the kind of persistence of that network? The one other thing that I would say about that, knowing that I do a lot of work on the historical evolution of these kind of nodes and networks of insecurity, including in the region that I mentioned, that there was a time at which you could follow a network. I think US-Mexico security cooperation has been structured around following a very identifiable network, let's say from Central America with migration and all, all sets of other things pushing people you know up the network but i think we're at a point where the larger region in which that network is existing is also now a kind of diplomatic problem 
So it's not just the network of insecurity, it's the kind of bounded nation state territoriality in which that network operates that brings new types of political challenges and conversations of the kind of host nation. So there's a, what used to be just a network is a network that's problematic in a region that's problematic. And, and I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Diane. Um, now we've talked about the borders and, and the, the bounded nation state territoriality. Now, Branshana, I guess from your point of view, if you think about outer space, that looks very different, right? How would you bring in that space? Uh, well, firstly, Annette, thank you very much. And it's wonderful to meet my colleagues here on the panel. Very interesting perspectives, but of course, rooted here, not the cyber though. Cyber is all pervasive, but I'm looking at all of you top down. I'm looking at you from outer space. And outer space have, has a ubiquitous presence in our life. So of course, for us, cyberspace is of vital importance because you can quite easily intercept the link between your ground station and the satellite, and you so don't want that to happen because it can ca cause catastrophic uh, you know, uh, destruction by way of collisions in space and so on. But when you're thinking of global security, and I noticed that you started from the top of the scale of global and then going down to the local, space is space security is the outcome of geopolitics and global because it started with the two military superpowers on the opposite ends of the ideological divide, which is Soviet Union and the USA. Now, in this mix, of course, you have a new uber super power, which happens to be China. And now who's going to come out to the top of the ladder? We do not know as yet. But the point is that as a result, so one, there is security that is required for space assets in outer space. The other is the use of space-enabled applications of services. All of these technologies are military technologies. So you know that during the Cold War years, the superpowers, although at opposite ends, although inimical to each other, found a modus vivendi during the Cold War years. And there, it was relative peace and has resulted, although that was not their intention, of a mechanism where these technologies ultimately came to be um, inducted into the military armed forces of the United States and first used in the first Gulf War, which was the first time that the rest of the countries around saw, what can I say, was it the magic, the awe of precision bombing, of the use of GPS to exactly target where you want to target. And going forward there, in 1991, also the event which was the fall of the Soviet Union and dissolution of the Soviet Union, leaving it into a unipolar world. And that in turn triggered uh, with the United States allowing those military technologies to be commercialized, to put to commercial use. And the rest of us um, suddenly found ourselves with Google Earth and so forth and so forth. Yes, the Western world would probably have already had these services, but for the, let me call myself Global South, the rest of the world that is not Europe and is not the United States, where in India, in fact, 1991, we uncapped our economy. Suddenly, the rest of the world was, you know, had all these gadgets in, in their hands. And telecommunications, satellite telecommunications became the thing. It is the experience of the use of military satellite technologies in warfare, including in the Iraq war, is what is when other countries were taking down, you know, the planners and the military planners were most definitely taking down notes and saying that, hey, we need to develop all this. So global security, when you talk in context to space, is definitely top down. Otherwise, countries had their security concern. They were fighting their wars and so forth, so forth, so forth. And of course, you had the United Nations and whatever is the outcome of that. A lot of those problems and a lot of those UN constructs were not at all connected with the people who had suffered the consequences of that, who had been the countries which have suffered the most also in the recent years, the entire Middle East, they have been a theater of war for what? Because they have the oil fields. 
Right. And so if, if, but I was curious to see the answers in your questionnaire where local content, there was zero. That is the place where your policy prescriptions and analysis must have some resonance. It must count for something. They have suffered and they continue to suffer. They don't know why. Right. So these are the different uh, ways of looking at global security, top down, down top, whatever you like. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Ranshana. Um, I think you made a fantastic point here with how the top down and the and the bottom up um, connects. And I'd like to bring this back to Kieran, also conscious of his 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 other commitment later on, because I have here one question um, from from an audience member. Uh, that reads, given what you said about the concentration of cyber criminals surrounding Moscow and St. Petersburg, um, could you elaborate on what the reasons might be for this concentration? And I'd like to just add to that and ask you, is that one of the nodes in the network that Diane talked about that we're also studying here? And is that the local context, perhaps, that we need to consider together with um, everything that's happened um, happens in other spaces? And just to add to that, if you don't mind, another follow-up question, which was in the in the Q and A, which is about what this then means for cross-state collaboration for addressing also evolving lar larger um, cybersecurity issues. So, how can we connect these local nodes, cross-state collaboration, and then of course the larger implications? In a very short <laughs> amount of time, yeah, I know. Huge, huge set of issues. I'll, I'll do my best, um, and as a um, uh, picking up on the excellent contributions of uh, Dan and Ranjana, I think the local um, the local part of this does matter in that um, you know uh, first of all, if you take the field of if you like um, digital malevolence, if you take people doing things that by and large you don't want them to be doing, we have tended, if you like, to sort of um, catastrophize it, sort of Hollywoodize it, and. You know, we've said that it'll be a bunch of states doing things where they'll be, you know, destroying everybody else's networks, and it'll be like a nuclear capability. And we now know it doesn't really, it doesn't really work uh, uh, like that. There's a whole bunch, and you know, when I was in an operational job, um, if we were looking at sort of cyber harm against the UK or an ally of the UK, um, we would sometimes know it was exactly this particular, um, uh, this particular group of people, and we know their names. Some of you would be watching them do it live, and you know who they were working for. And they might be working for a government, they might be working for a criminal organization, all the way through to not knowing what continent it was from. And then also, when you were sort of trying to work out how to stop this, given that, you know, short of actually going in with some sort of military capability, which you never do um, in, uh, in, in uh, peacetime, you had to work out whether or not this was actually acts from on behalf of the state or within the state. And that's where this local sort of um, uh, point comes in. You know, the relationship of um, people acting malevolently, you know, if they're working for the government, that's one thing. If they're tolerated by the government, that's another thing. If they're actually um, opposed by the government, but the government's too weak to do anything about them, that's another thing uh, still. So that sort of governance um, matters. Um, in terms of, uh, in, uh, and so it is part of the nodes, if you like. Um, so if you take, for example, there's a major sort of um, data breach in Australia, which ended up in the release of um, over a third of the population's medical records onto the so-called uh, dark web. And um, the, the Australians say with confidence that this comes from a criminal group within Russia, but they're left relying saying, well, you know, we'll see what, we'll see what Interpol can do. So that brings to the point about um, state collaboration. Um, uh, there are some rules on the global conduct of business in cyberspace, not really very many. It's still a fundamentally ungoverned space and it's still a space where nobody really trusts anybody else. Um, you know, there's a reason why the, the, the government hasn't got together despite all the calls for a digital Geneva Convention from the likes of the Microsoft president, you know, we're nowhere near the digital Geneva Convention because I can't think of a, of a government in the world, Western, non-Western, authoritarian, uh, liberal democratic, I can't think of a government in the world that actually really genuinely wants one uh, because the sort of the, the, the trust isn't there. So you are left with a hodgepodge of alliances and you're left with a hodgepodge of sort of um, operational uh, capabilities. And in a sense, um, I think one of the biggest problems then, which comes back to the local, is that for as long as there are pockets in the world where people can operate freely and with impunity, either under state protection or under state tolerance, then you've got a problem. Um, you can do uh, interstate collaboration um, to sort of harden your defenses, to sort of, you know, um, pull capabilities and so forth. 
but that's not been done at global level it's been done at sort of block level and i think that's where we are at the moment and that's where we're likely to be for some time to come Thank you so much, um, Karen. I know you need to run soon. I, I just would like to briefly ask you to just respond to the, the question that we usually ask the end, at the end, which is if there's any book or publication or podcast that you would like to recommend to our audience, perhaps tying it to what you were just um, mentioning. Yeah, and so this that's back. sort of easy in that, um, in the context particularly of the horrific Russia-Ukraine war, uh, there's been a lot of talk um, around cyber capabilities and the role of cyber in the war. And there's a book, and it's actually 10 years old, which is you know, ancient in, in cyber security terms, but it's sort of held up, um, it's, it's held up pretty well. And it's by, um, I've actually, I've been carrying it around as a prop, so I've got it. It's called uh, Cyber War Will Not Take Place by Professor Thomas Ridge of John Hopkins, University of Formerly of King's College, London. And I don't really like the title because it's a bit, um, it's a bit twee and it's a bit, it, some clever pun on a 1930s French play, apparently. Um, but it's essentially explaining that um, cyber instability is really complicated. It's not a weapon, it's about code. It's actually as much, um, it's a permanent feature of intimidation, harassment, theft, and so on, outside of formal war, um, and actually a relatively limited use in it. So forget everything you've seen in Hollywood movies, forget War Games 1983 about, you know, a teenage hacker accidentally starting World War III. Uh, forget you know buildings collapsing planes falling out of the, uh, of the sky because of cyberspace and so on that can happen but not by a not not by a computer code attack if you like not by a computer network um attack it can happen through uh, physically physical destruction of some of the assets that Ranjana deals with um other forms of you know, more conventional uh, uh force and instead just think of cyber as a sort of chronic uh problem that destabilizes sows mistrust um, it, you know, it's uh, more pernicious than, uh, than, than sort of catastrophically potent. And I think in an era where that's oh, misunderstood a lot in public policy circles, the RID book is still the best account of why it's very different to traditional characterization. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thanks, Karen. Thanks. And yeah, goodbye to you. <laughs> but everyone else, please stay. <laughs> um, Diane, I would like to connect this again back to you, your work. I mean, Kian was just talking about those local pockets, right? And in a way, as long as there are these spaces that are ungoverned, I would rather say perhaps illicitly governed or governed differently, right? Um, it's also hard to have effective state collaboration to, to promote security. Could you talk a little bit about how you see kind of the interaction of those different spaces across scale and the work that is needed to make sure that the state can come in to some extent um, to, to address those non-state issues. Yeah, I mean, I, I was actually going to pick up after after Ranjana spoke and mentioned the importance of the local, I was already making a few notes. And so this is a perfect question, Aneta. Um, I, I guess I want to say that I, I do agree, Ranjana, that kind of the local is absolutely key. But part of the problem, maybe I'm just summarizing what's being, what that which has been said but part of the problem is we mobilize actors institutions and resources at the global level for obvious i mean there are obvious reasons but and part of that is because it's really there's so many localities to be addressed that in some ways it's more efficient and national governments are interested in the global cooperation so it's almost like we have this phrase here in the US who asks often, you know, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. So you are able to mobilize resources on the global level and it makes it hard. It's really hard to address these problems at the local level because they're at every locality. So that, that's the dilemma. I might share just a minute of a kind of an example. When I was at MIT, we started a project. I think you know about this, Aneta that the US State, USAID funded with support from the State Department called Urban Resilience in Situations of Chronic Violence. We were looking at violence in cities around the world. And it was a real slog to get this research project approved because USAID tends to have relationships at the national level. They don't really have a lot, or back then, and this was about 15 years ago, a lot of operations or programs that were focused on the local level. So even coming down to the local level is difficult because the institutions 
are not set up to deal with localities as easily as nation states and agreements nationally. Now with the cybersecurity problems, where, where there's even more pressure to kind of go up on the scale. So I guess I'm just repeating the, the importance and the problematic of dealing with the local. Now, what? how might I answer this? And this, uh, um, if we can't deal with all, look, there are so many more localities, right? The number is infinite. The number of nation states is not infinite, right? But if there's a problem all over, how do we kind of bridge that difference between thinking on a larger scale nationally or in global agreements versus the local? This is where the border, I think, is important. That in some ways you can look at strategic places where you can focus down on localities in territories that bring the nations together. And this is why I do a lot of, I, I'm very interested in border territories, as is Aneta, because you can work locally in those border areas. You can understand exactly the dynamics and how people go under the radar screen in the nodes at that border area, but you're also able to have a conversation both transnationally between the two nations let's say that share that border, or maybe it's three, depending on the geography and the, and the larger scale. And I do think that this is why border studies are absolutely central to the this discussion moving forward, because it allows us to kind of bridge that difference between the local and the global. Thank you so much. Thanks, Diane. Um, Ranjana, let me bring this back to you. I mean, from your, you already said, you come there from a very top-down perspective, obviously, <laughs> right? and that we don't I, see these borders. I mean, in the end, they're also social constructs. Oh, yet they, they matter locally. And even, I mean, you mentioned the relevance in the Cold War, the way in which technology for outer space has developed also through military technology. Where do you see this tension then between the, the, the non-visible borders, if you want, but the very relevance of states in that sense? So as much as outer space, and I, I agree with everything that Diane has said, that yes, if you are doing these programs, to actually put in place something in the specific local community within that national, I know, uh, I mean, India is about as complex as anything else can possibly be, because we have so many languages to begin with. So in the first place to try and communicate with people in your own country with completely different languages, is not the easiest uh, task to do. But coming back to space, in fact, we look at uh, national borders, international borders very closely from space, as you know, but more than military. And frankly, yes, military space is there and there it is, we have to deal with it and whatever are the outcomes, we shall live through it. But space is also about international cooperation. It's about mutual assistance. and willy-nilly during the Cold War years, as a result of, uh, you know, uh, modus vivendi, as I said, between the powers and subsequent years. What has happened is that civil space applications have grown exponentially in every aspect of life. For example, right now, um, the COPIUS, which is the, the, legal sub, uh, the legal committee on uh, peaceful uses of outer space of the United Nations. So it has two subcommittees, and there is one working group at this moment. Uh, well, in fact, uh, COPIUS is dedicated to what we call Space 30, which is in support of the SDGs, uh, and to try and see how space applications can help that. So there is a working group on global health issues. And we are examining to see what are the gaps between this national, international, the national, the transnational capacity building. In fact, under the UN uh, umbrella, under the COPIUS umbrella, there are training centers around the world to help countries that do not, are not yet economically or scientifically, technologically advanced to the level that they need to be. And indeed, around the world, uh, not only is it a case that there are 11 spacefaring nations, that is to say, who can build and launch and maintain on their own, but there are a range of countries. There are almost 80 countries that access space to get other countries to launch for them. And in the recent past, there are new uh, emerging space paths who all within the next two to three years, you will find new countries launching into space with lunar programs, so forth. 
and as uh, you know, you probably may have seen it in the news, the African countries are also very active in establishing space programs and coming together in an African space uh, agency sort of so that all the countries together can deal with it. So space is extremely beneficial. And quite honestly, when I look at the Outer Space Treaty, I'm convinced that even though it was an unintended consequence of what the two superpowers were wanting to do, is that it is meant for peace. It is meant for international cooperation and it is meant for being used, its application for the betterment of humankind on Earth. This is what I think. I mean, it's easy to go to war and you know do all of the things that you would uh, make you feel better, maybe some people, but for the rest of us and for the rest of the world, it just needs to be uplifted. You, all of you are doing so much of academic work and a lifetime of uh, you know, working in border areas to see what can be done with all of those things across the world. This is awesome. This is awesome work. And um, I think you can't have enough of it because the world is so big and there's so many vast territories that are not at the level of uh, development. Yeah. even on very basic terms. The space must be used for the betterment of all mankind. Thank you so much, Ranjana. Let me just quickly follow up on that because I received here a question um, before we bring it back to, um, to Diane as well. Could you share your thoughts here? I'm reading the question now. Could you share your thoughts on the implications of the privatization of space technology and space flight for cooperation or rivalry in outer space? I think that's particularly important given that we were just talking about how states are using that either for um, well, for the purpose of fighting war or for peaceful collaboration. How do we then think about those private actors? Well, the private actors under the space treaty, private uh, enterprise, that is non-government activities in space was allowed because at the point in time when the treaty was being negotiated, as much as the Soviet Union was inclined only for state activities in outer space, the United States already had uh, the uh, Satellite Corporation uh, since 1963. And it was already had a program going with European countries. This was a result, I suppose, of the Second World War where uh, the allied uh, countries must have thought that we need better communications. And so uh, the Satellite uh, Corporation, uh, Communication Satellite Corporation, was already being regulated under FCC. And so that um, allowance was made, and there's a specific clause uh, article in the Outer Space Treaty that makes the state responsible for making sure that the private actor uh, or commercial actor will conform to the principles of the Outer Space Treaty and also an uh, article which makes the state responsible for liability in the event of damage caused by a space object of, I mean, either the state or the non-government in space, in airspace, and in outer space, and outer space includes the moon and other celestial bodies. Thanks. In fact, it extends to our entire solar system. Thanks, thanks. So you basically, you see still the state with a crucial role in that. I mean, that brings me back to, to Diane's point before that um, it is actually hard to get state agencies to work across those different um, levels. And one, one of the questions here, again, that I, I've received here is to see, given that um, institutions often try to tackle, in that case, the local problems at the, at the global level, how can, what is it that we can from perhaps academia do to um, incentivize or to help practitioners and policymakers um, resist addressing security issues at the wrong level or at the, perhaps at, in, a, in an insufficient way? Would you have any thoughts to share on perhaps from your experience also with the, with the MIT project you just mentioned with USID, um, if there is a way of changing those dynamics um, to integrate the local with the national and probably then also the global level. Yeah, no, that's the kind of billion dollar question. So um, I, I actually, I'm not too optimistic only listening to our other panelists because there are so many other scales of global security that are grabbing the attention. 
So when I started this project 15 years ago, I mean, obviously there's work on cyber and security, et cetera, and outer space, but that's the attention has been focused on that more in the last decade or two. Um, and both the outer space, I, I'll just make a comment, it has a lot to do with like international political economy and like who who's, it's, it's about peace, but it's about peace because there's a war about who go, is going to get that territory and make them whose economy is going to benefit most from controlling that territory. But back to your question, Annette, I also saw uh, one of the other, I'm thinking a little bit more about another question in the Q&A. So I guess I'm just saying that um, it's it's tough for, for citizens and policymakers, like local authorities, depending on what kind of political system you have. Some systems are more centralized, some are more decentralized, the federal system, to kind of keep the conversation <clears throat> down at the scale closer to every people's everyday lives. So that's a political project to make sure that you continually talk about um, dealing with security questions at the scale that matters to individuals. We don't talk about that in, in American elections. I mean, people don't talk about it again. It's like, this is the experts area and we don't bring it down to people's lives. So that's, uh, it's, it's hard, not impossible. I'm sure some of the people in the webinar are studying to be able to learn how to do this. But the other thing I wanted to address, there was a question in the Q and A, if you don't mind, about resilience and cybersecurity. So I, I, I wanted to use the occasion to say a little something about what we found in that work for USAID and the, and the project and we looked at like seven cities, some in Africa, some in Latin America, some in South Asia. So it was a kind of a global project. But ultimately, some of these problems that had to do with like chronic violence, which is fueled by either illicit activities like drug trafficking or political violence, you know, ongoing civil war or versions of ongoing political violence. Basically, those problems are super hard to solve at the local level without all the other, without like war making and without, you know, kind of other actors. So what we ended up doing in that report was distinguishing be between what we called positive, negative and equilibrium resilience. In other words, I think we resilience, as everybody on this webinar knows, is a totally overabused concept and nobody knows exactly what it means. And it kind of makes you feel good that maybe you're kind of, you know, pushing the envelope and, and creating more security. So many of these problems we're talking about have no easy solutions. So what we wanted to do is look at, are there strategies and tactics that can prevent things from getting worse? That's what we meant, negative resilience. And I'll give a really quick example. I know we're running out of time, but when we were looking at like drug trafficking in Sao Paulo, there are deals between drug traffickers and citizens that they make themselves that looks like they're, it's stopping the problem, stopping the violence, but those deals only empower the drug traffickers. So that would be an example of negative resilience. It looks for a moment like the problem is solved, but you don't get at the root causes of the problem. So I think what we have to do is look at the root origins of whatever scale of security we're looking at and see if we can have strategies just to keep things to undermine the power or to kind of find a wedge in the power of the kind of structural relations that produce that problem. Most of the work that we did found that strategies brought at best equilibrium resilience. It didn't get a lot worse, but it didn't get a lot better. Because when you're talking about violence, and I'm sure we could say the same thing about struggles over space or cybersecurity, that cat is out of the bag. Are we really going to ever get rid of that as a problem? But so we have to think about making sure that we have strategies that allow the people that that kind of benefit from cybersecurity from not persisting in, you know, in their activities to the same degree. And whether that's the law or whether that's international treaties or whether that's local efforts it is an open question. The problem with cybersecurity is it's it's it may impact lo locally but it's on the net so it's not local so i don't know i guess i'm just laying out the complexity of the challenges that we're facing that you that you are facing aneta with this the webinar and and all these bringing people together it's a hugely complex problem thanks thank you well, yes, it's complex, but I do think we are, we are kind of getting to at least some starting points, right, in terms of how we can think about it. I mean, you mentioned right now 
that um, in the context of people, right? that people are often not even thought about, that their suffering is not acknowledged, or I mean, that relates to what Ranshana mentioned previously about um, people across the Middle East. Now, of course, it's individuals, it's people, but we also know that there are huge inequalities between nations. And one of the purposes here of the webinar is also to have an inclusive debate, to look at um, basically perspectives from, from across the globe. So I'd like to therefore bring this to the one of the other questions in the in the Q and A, which is to you, Ranchana, where someone asks, "Do the finite nature of spaces, um, due to the finite nature of spaces in the low Earth orbit, how can new spacefaring nations possibly catch up to established spacefaring nations?" So what do we do with those? I mean, you mentioned the ones that have started um, the technology, right, and that now there are more and more states that also strive to um, well, be present. How can that even work, given that we see these huge inequalities that results in violence, that results in insecurity on, um, uh, on, on, on Earth, on, on, the, on the territory, right? When we take this to the space, does that just produce more tensions? Or would you say that there's an opportunity to actually achieve more equality? Look, first and foremost, space, is open for access and for use, for exploration, for peaceful purpose to every single country and every single non-government entity of that country. And this includes everything through to deep space. Now the question is that there were some countries that developed these, there were only two to begin with. Today there are 11 countries that have developed indigenous technology, meaning their own people have developed technologies to operate in space. There are new countries that aspire and quite obviously the kind of poverty and inequality we are talking about is of a different nature than that country providing budgetary support to its science and technology development for the purpose of uh, space technology, for developing space technology. Also remember that space technology, India of the 11 is the only country that established a space program for civil purpose. Every other country has established a space program for military purpose. And when we were asked why it is that we need a space program, we are talking year of 1959-60, as you are such a poor country, what is your problem? And our leaders at the time said, we want to harness this for to economic development of our country, not to compete with any military power. We're not interested in that game. And so therefore, telemedicine, teleeducation, uh, mapping the geography of the country to see where our agricultural lands are, which lands have been er eroded, which are the forests that are being cut down, what is our border area, for example, looking like. All of this is communication across the length and breadth of the country. It's a subcontinent. India is a subcontinent. And we have the legacy of a colonial uh, rule for a long time and princely states, everything coming together. So really our life as a republic got started in 1950, even though we got independence in 47. So we have harnessed these technologies for our country's socioeconomic development. And show for what show India has many bilateral and multilateral cooperation uh, agreements with many countries. And there is much more that we can do for each other. So that is one part of it, this problem of poverty and so forth. The other part is, if a country wishes to develop its indigenous technologies, it will do that. And in fact, indeed, as we speak, it is doing that. And those technologies can be harnessed for socioeconomic development. If you look at what uh, some of the new African countries that have declared a space policy, they want to use it for telemedicine and teleeducation. Of course, security is important. There will be some technologies which will be of military nature for the protection of their sovereign uh, territories and so forth. But most definitely, it will all be harnessed for the betterment of their people. So as Diane was saying that, you know, how do you translate it at national level? I mean, you plan it, uh, international programs, all of that, but right down to that last person on the street, that has to be a national uh, sort of energy that has to be. And 
of course, these are old countries, old towns, old whatever it is, fixated notions, little ecosystem, maybe it's a drug runner, maybe it's a guy who's helping him, but he's getting money every month to feed his family. It's an extremely complex situation. It's truly, truly complex when you get down to the earth. I deal, I, I am part of some NGOs that we work in these, and I have, you know, very hands-on experience of what happens. I'm talking of urban poverty. Forget about going to places far and, you know, distant. It's, it's, it's overwhelming. Thank you so but much. space can be harnessed for this. Th thanks. They thanks. Can, they can actually operate in the low earth orbit. There's absolutely no difficulty. It's a huge, huge, huge expanse. But what you do need for everyone to operate is consensus between the superpowers in the copious so that regulations can be made for an orderly conduct of all countries of their space activities. That is not happening. Thank you. Thanks. I think you made a really important point about, again, linking the different scales levels. Of course, the challenge is, is which country has the capacity to develop those technologies that can then be used um, also at the at the local level or to improve the situation at the at the local level. Um, I'm conscious of time and I know Diane uh, has to run as well. So again, I'm very grateful that you all make time in your in your busy schedules. Diane, before you leave, I just also would like to see if you have any final comment, remark or thought also on what we just heard from Ranchana, but then also as I asked Kieran, um, because we know there are lots of interested students out there in our in our audience. I'd like to see if you have a book or publication, a podcast that you would recommend to our audience to, to better understand global security from your perspective. Right. Um, thank you. I mean, I'm going to, I actually have two books that I wanted to recommend, but they, they, they speak to something that we haven't talked about. And I know we can't do everything in this, this particular webinar, but I want to kind of put on the table in the context of work that I do on these corridors and scales, et cetera, the issue of climate change. So, I mean, I think we cannot, uh, in, I, I don't know how that interfaces with, with space and the cybersecurity, so we can leave that aside, but I want to say that in my own work on global security issues at, this ter at the territorial scale, climate change is absolutely urgent to understand the intensity of the, of the problems and, you know, kind of ratcheting up the ways in which yeah, the whole debate about what climate security is is exploding in the region that I that, that I work in. So let's not forget as we look at technology, technological innovation, there's also climate change. There are two like, you know, these issues hovering over our conversations about how we think about security. So the two books and in the work, again, I mentioned Central America, well, you and you where you work in Africa and other places, the ways in which people are not, you can map from space agricultural output, but knowing that it's declining is not is not enough, right? We need to do something about the climate. So some of the focus in the climate in the security sector um, field is not focusing enough on a of the, the the elephant in the room, which is climate change, it seems to me. So the two books that I would recommend, one um is called borderland border water a history of the construction of the u.s mexico divide by cj alvarez that's very focused i know everybody's not interested in mexico but the way in which this border region which you are looking at which is where there's smuggling and there's so many things happening is also being transformed because of water issues and then the second one that i think will be of greater interest to your audience which i really love is a book called Climate Leviathan, A Political Theory of Our Planetary Future by Jeff Mann and Joel Wainwright. And what it does, and this is where I'll close, it picks up this issue that you've mentioned, Aneta and Ranjana. It basically argues that although we know climate change <clears throat> is a global planetary problem, the action has to be at the nation state. That's why it's called Climate Leviathan. The nation states have to come in. <clears throat> so I think it summarizes some of the themes that we've <clears throat> discussed here today. And um, with that, I'm going to have to go just because I have another meeting in two minutes. Um, so I'm sorry to leave before the end, Ranjan. I'll, you'll have to write me what your what your books are that you're recommending. But thank you so, not, so much, Annetta, for, for including me in this. 
Thank you so much. Thanks, Diane. And thanks sure. for the amazing recommendation. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Diane. Lovely to meet you. Right. Um, let's turn to you, Ranshana. Um, I mean, also, we've heard again the role of the of the nation state, right? How um, central it still sure, is, sure. despite sure. all these levels. Is there a publication you would, you would back yeah. on? Diane was talking about climate change, and there couldn't be a bigger problem that is looming upon us and experiencing. I think we are all experiencing, except especially the tropical, that zone. I have advice. I have, you know, there are young startup companies. It is not just that you take a static picture and you know that the glacier is melting or this. But here is a situation. You have, for example, meteorological data of rainfall over the last 100 years. They're using artificial intelligence. They are using new images of meteorologicals from satellites. They are wedding it all together. They're wedding it to the uh, space, uh, the earth observation images of agricultural land. And like I said, India is a very vast country. So they are looking at areas where the rainfall pattern has changed what it is likely to be, and they're making predictions. And they are able to see the cloud formation so they know when the rains are going to come, the monsoons are going to come, and they're advising agriculture. And they're working with uh, national, in fact, state, you know, provincial governments through the agricultural department to provide this information to the field, that is, to the farmers. There are amazing things that are happening, wedding, space technology, space application, cyber, on ground, local language. You have no idea how dynamic this whole field is emerging. It, um, you know, at my age, I feel hopeful that even for a vast country and for vast areas of the world where this kind of thing can happen, it's amazing. In fact, they have clients in Africa they're able to help, uh, you know, where these are arid lands, some of them, how are you going to harness it, even to grow a crop for the family, if not a little bit extra to sell. These are the bread and butter issues, and there is a lot of development happening as far as creating software programs. Everything finally becomes a software. So software programs in context to climate change and the glacial movements on what is it that we can do, not that it's going to ha happen at uh, anything beneficial overnight, because this is nature after all, but what is it that we need to do to prevent this sort of thing from happening, or at least slow it down in a way that whatever it is that was built, for example, you broke down the mountainside and built luxury homes, and everything's coming cascading down for the reason that you know there's so much carrying capacity or that the mountain or the tectonic plates suddenly start shifting and there are uh, gaps that are forming all of a sudden, then all these things that are, uh, these are happening. You can't control nature. Look at Turkey and Syria just now. Who could predict? But for all of that, there are these applications that are developing. And I think we have to create those and harness those first and foremost. Thank you so much. Thanks. I think it's fantastic that you add here to the recommendations um, something very practical, right? I mean, we tend to think about books and articles, and of course, they are very important, relevant, but you bring in your, your kind of practitioner side as well, where, yes, we need to look also at what startups are doing, what um, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship is doing, and tools such as the software that you just mentioned are, of course, um, crucial here. So thank you so much for that, for that recommendation. We're coming to the end. End of the of the webinar. Um, so I'd like to thank um, Manshana and also I'd still like to thank Diane and Kiaran who had to leave a little bit earlier for their excellent contributions. I'd also like to thank the audience for their for their great questions for for being with us. Next week we'll have the next webinar in our series um, where we'll be exploring the political dimension of global security. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers again. Um, Rana Mirner, Mitter will be joining us, um, Samira Duale, Tomas Tieko, Igor Kretzky, and Samuel Makinda. And you can also find all the information on, this, on the website of the Blavatnik School of Government and of Pembroke College's um, 
page as well. So we hope that you will be joining us again. Thanks again to everyone. Um, we'll also make the conversation available as a podcast later on. And I just would like to end by um, wishing you a great rest of the day and goodbye. Thank you so much.